Today, we go back nearly 40 years to an attack on Lod Airport near Tel Aviv, in which more than 20 people were killed. Some listeners may find this report by Simon Watts distressing. It's May the 30th, 1972, and a team of gunmen launch an attack at Israel's main airport. They are Japanese left-wing extremists working for a Palestinian organisation. These three men apparently arrived at Tel Aviv airport on an Air France plane. Eyewitnesses say the men waited with the other passengers at the luggage conveyor belt inside the customs hall. When their luggage arrived, they took Kalachnikov automatic rifles and hand grenades from their suitcases and opened fire indiscriminately at everyone in their vicinity. Ross Sloboda, a British woman living in Israel, had just reached the airport. Then, 23, she'd gone with a friend to meet a plane arriving from the UK. The flight from London that our friend was on was announced as approaching, so we got up to move towards the arrivals hall. And in those days, the place where people stood to meet those who had arrived was separated from the actual arrivals hall where the luggage came in on the carousel simply by huge panes of glass. Suddenly, I heard a banging sound. We all looked at each other thinking, what is this noise? And suddenly, these huge panes of glass shattered. They came cascading down and I watched them and I remember thinking, this looks just like rain. It looks like raindrops. And then people started falling to the floor. And there is blood everywhere. It's everywhere, very quickly. And it suddenly occurred to me that this was something so awful. People were trying to kill us. I turned to run, and as I turned, this huge hole appeared in the back of my thigh, and I realised I had been shot. I ran, and um, I went to hide under a chair. And you know what chairs are like at airports? They're really low. I have no idea how I got under there. It must have been adrenaline, I suppose. You're talking about something that is utterly terrifying when you think you're going to lose your life not because you're terminally ill but because you have gone to an airport something as innocuous as an airport and there are three men in this case armed with machine guns and hand grenades they don't know anything about you but they're trying to kill you they're trying to kill all of us and I remember thinking Oh, God, I could die here. Supposing I die, I kept saying that to myself. And I, I saw a, a picture in my mind of my house in London, of my family. And then it seemed to go on forever. And I thought, when will this stop? Any minute now, I was waiting for the next bullet to hit me. I was just waiting for it. And then it, it, it was over. Clearly it was over, because there was a kind of eerie quiet. And then there was a soldier standing next to me. I remember that because I couldn't get out of this chair. I was stuck. He pulled me out. And I, I remember smelling cordite and the man next to me was dead and he had no face. His face had been blown off and his head was resting in his wife's lap. I know it was his wife. And she looked at me and I looked at her, just a look of utter incomprehension. And I felt she was thinking, well, if you'd been standing here, you would have been dead. And if my husband had been standing where you were, I, you know, he would have been alive. And then I started running around the airport like a clockwork mouse. I really think that's a good description because I was going off in all directions and I had no pain at all. I felt no pain at all. And I think most people who are caught up in incidents like this all say that they felt no pain. I think it's shock. I think it's the body's way 
of coping. Of course I must have been in pain, but I can honestly say I don't remember any pain. And I found my friend who had hid behind a pillar and she was OK. Our first thought was, we have to get out of here. We just have to get out of here. So we went outside the terminal building and hailed a taxi. And we drove to Tel HaShomer Hospital, out just outside Tel Aviv. More than 70 others were injured in the attack. 26 people died, many of them Puerto Rican Christians, on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. In hospital, Ros Loboda found herself next to a member of this group. The woman next to me was Puerto Rican and she was pregnant, clearly. She kept asking where her husband was and the doctors were saying to each other, who met, who met, which means he's dead, he's dead. And I was listening to this and I thought, I hope she doesn't ask me anything. But of course, the doctors then left her and she turned to me and she said, they can't find my husband. Do you think he's all right? And she looked at me very searchingly and I thought, what can I say to her? So I lied and I said that it was all chaotic and that I'm sure that, you know, very soon that she would know what had happened. And she said, oh, thank you. And then I remember I turned away so that she couldn't see my face. And I remember thinking, this is so awful. Ros Loboda found it difficult to stay in Israel and returned to Britain later in 1972 to be close to her relatives. She started a family of her own and had a successful career, but the attack changed her outlook on life. Something fundamentally changed. I know the way that I think now and how I've changed. First of all, the empathy that I have for people caught up. Unfortunately, the world we live in now, there are so many people caught up in these terrible incidents. I fire off letters to people who sometimes who've been caught up in these incidents, which I would never have done, I don't think, if I hadn't been involved myself in such an incident. The second thing is that we humans like to think we are in control of our lives. And I realised that night that we're not in control, really, and that's quite a frightening concept, I think, for a human being. So much of it is luck. And for me, it was luck in that I was standing where I was and not a couple of feet to my right, because, as I said, I would have been dead. And the third thing is that you never lose the feeling that something terrible could happen when you least expect it either to myself or the people I care about. You never get over it. Every time I hear a balloon bursting or a car backfiring, I can't go anywhere where there are fireworks. I'm transported straight back there. The images are, you know, indelibly printed on my mind and they always will be. In Israel, the attack led to a major overhaul of airport security. Two of the Japanese gunmen had died during the assault. The other served 13 years before being released in a prisoner swap. That report from Simon Watts.